Hey folks, welcome back to Patriot Ridge Farm. So, we <laughs> my big rock pile right there and my firewood behind it. So, <laughs> this is the final step. I'm just I'm getting the gravel delivered tomorrow. We only had to have 400 square feet of gravel base in front of the greenhouse as what they considered a high use area. Um, but because of the relationship of the greenhouse to my driveway, which is right here, just come up the hill and turn in there. Um, we decided we would just run the gravel from there all the way out to at least right there. And I left this end um, without a six by six there because we're probably just gonna bring the gravel out and around this way. And besides when everybody backs around here, they back, tend to back this way. So <laughs> anyways, um, so we did the whole, whole end of, or both sides of it here. I went with six by sixes treated ground contact. There is uh, two 16 footers here. And then this one is 105 inches. And then on this side, of course, Menards didn't have all the six by sixes, all the 16 footers I need. We did two 18 footers here. And I was thinking about capping the end of this, but I decided I just wasn't going to do it because I'm just going to bring the gravel probably out this way. And I didn't want that little bit more sticking out because as we do landscaping around the house after the porches are done, because we're redoing our porches, then um, all this rock goes up to up close to the house for landscaping purposes. So we'll just bring the gravel right around this way. Uh, I still got a bunch of stuff here. I got to get picked up and everything like that. My blood buckets from the, the chicken processing, they're all hosed out, cleaned out. They're just sitting there. That tarp's got to get thrown away and I need to get my fuel cans up in the building. <sighs> excuses, excuses, I know. Anyways, so this part is done. I got, I think, 25 or 26 tons of gravel coming tomorrow. And I'll just go through and load it in here as he dumps it in the driveway, dump, dump a big pile. I'll just use a little Kubota and bring it over here and just start dumping along the edges to kind of seat this stuff down. And then I'll just dump from the sides out so I don't crunch up this, uh, this fabric. This is that Geotech fabric. This stuff is really good stuff. It allows water to go down through and it allows air to get to the ground. It doesn't allow weeds or grass to grow up through the middle of it. Uh, versus the plastic where it'll just let water go through, but it doesn't let the ground breathe as well. So all this will get filled with gravel tomorrow. I just got some big rocks and stuff on here to kind of hold the, the seams down together because stuff's only four foot wide. I got the bulk of the stuff out of here. This is just the leftover polycarbonate panels, and I'm going to take them down and put them in the uh, in a shipping container I have down at the bottom of the hill and uh, the, the metal, all the metal posts and bars and stuff that were left over is going in there as well. Just a little final pickup and clean up in here. There's some of that geotech fabric. It's really good stuff. Pretty thick and I, it doesn't tear easily. We, when I did the video to show that this thing was done, so we went ahead that evening. I had to run the Menards. I got an outdoor breaker box. We put the electric line in the conduit, ran it up. Got some flexible conduit, ran it up, got the fan hooked up, and this thing inflated pretty quick. And you don't want it tight, you don't want it drum tight, you want to be able to push in at least a half inch real easy. I don't know how well that's going to show up on the camera. But anyways, so we got it inflated, and then I had to adjust the flow of the fan uh, to so it doesn't you know overinflate and balloon it out. But it runs continuously. And the purpose of this is, is that with a double layer with air in between it, it provides better insulation value. And it also decreases the wear on the, the plastic on both layers of the plastic as well. So, <sighs> it's been a long time coming. I get that gravel done tomorrow. I'll be calling the NRCS Monday morning and saying, come and inspect this thing and give me my money back. <laughs> because that's that's how the program works and i know i've told, talked about this in previous videos so the way that the grant program works for the nrcs it's through the equip eqip program and it's the same thing with the well you front the money get the work done or you do the work and it's just like with the well well company come out drilled the hole put the casing in dump the or drop the pump in the uh in well pressure tank down in there hooked up the um the hydrant here Flip the hydrant on, water came out, they were happy. And RCS come down, flip the hydrant up, see the water come out, reimburse me the money for the well. Then we turn around and bought this. Now, the stipulations for this is the same thing as long as it's built to manufacture specifications, which it is. 
and there has to be 400 square feet of gravel in front of it as a high use area or high traffic type area and as long as everything's done right and the fans inflating it and the gravel's there they'll turn around and reimburse me the money for this which is great we've been waiting on that like i said this has been a long time coming and i have I don't feel guilty at all calling somebody in to come and finish this and paying them for it. Not a bit. <laughs> because I'd have never still, I'd have still never got, even gotten near as far as they did. And, and it's just a it, full-time job, farm responsibilities, family responsibilities. I, there's just so much that goes on that, you know, a lot of people think if this was my full-time hobby, if this is, if I didn't have to have to work and, and I could do this, that's one thing. But you know, you got so many other responsibilities. Life gets in your way of living, and that's the truth. Now, Hurricane Helene, everything that's going on down south, and I am not making a plug for myself or anything that I've, I've said in previous videos. Earlier on, I discussed more emergency preparedness and stuff in my videos. I still kind of touch on it a little bit. Those poor folks, they don't get hurricanes in the mountains. They got hurricanes in the mountains. And they were already saturated from a previous rain event. And Helene came in and stalled right over top of them. And them poor folks, God, I can't tell you how much my heart just goes out to them. And, you know, again, I'm in a position which, as a registered nurse, I just can't up and leave my job as much as I'd love to go down there and help them. We had the same kind of event. Well, in, in 1985, here in West Virginia, we had a, it was in November of 1985, we had a very significant flooding event, and I mean, it flooded, like, in 53 years, I've never seen it flood that way again, and even my parents, my mom, she's 85, she said she'd never seen a flood that bad, uh, even to this day, and that geography and topography down there is the exact same as it is here, I know exactly where those places are, our cabin came from Campobello, South Carolina, right on 26, about 20 miles outside of Asheville and we antique shopped and did everything my front door come from Tryon North Carolina um, there's a lot of antiques and stuff in our house that came from uh, Tryon um, Bat Cave uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other places we hit all the antique shops while we were down there uh, when we went down and was, was designing the house and everything so you know we know the area the, the biggest difference down there is there's more pine trees down there than there is here so you know it's it's understandable to realize how how quickly the flooding happened down there and the devastation that it had in 2001 when i was still with the military my unit got activated for southern west virginia they had a storm down there that was just it was phenomenal i mean i've seen cars in trees and i'm talking 15 16 18 feet up in trees there were cars sitting in them there were empty foundations, what was left of foundations, and no house to be seen. Um, it took roads out. I mean, it took bridges out. It did everything. So, you know, I, I've been exposed to that kind of destruction before. And thank the good Lord, I've never, I've never lived through it. Other than in 77, where we, the house that we had when my mom and dad divorced, we lived right on the edge of a creek that packed up to the local river. And we got up one morning, and the, uh, it was wintertime. And the bathroom, it was a two-story house that we were renting, and the bathroom was downstairs in the basement. So the bathroom was down there, and then we had like a chest freezer down there, and Mom had just bought a, a whole cow, and we just packed that freezer full. And we got up in the morning to go get ready for school, and I walked down to the first floor, and I opened up the door to go down the basement to the bathroom, and the water, I took one step down. Of course, you're all bleary-eyed. I was a kid. I was six years old. I took one step down, my feet got wet, and I opened, I cleared my eyes and, and looked, and looking down the steps, it was just muddy water, and here's the freezer just bobbing in front of me. I was like, Mom, something's wrong. <laughs> it was bad. It was really bad. But these poor folks down there, I mean, the way you look at the, at the, the topography down there, you've got hills, hollers, mountains, and, and you get draws, so you get these areas like this that... In between my fingers here, that's like that's what they call a draw, or some people call it golly or something like that. Those those are draws, and that water channels down them draws, and I mean it just it picks up speed and velocity, and I mean you could see not only just the water itself, but it, it eroded 
violently eroded so much. I mean, just look at some of the cars on those videos and how mangled and twisted they are. So there was a lot of power down there in those floods. And, you know, those poor folks that lived, that, that got, you know, impacted by that, you know, some of them had just like tree damage and stuff like that. Others had mudslides come clear down off the hill, roads wiped out, houses completely gone. And, and you know, you, like I said before, you can prepare, but when all of your prepared, prepared items disappear with your house, what are you going to do? So, you know, and it, it, it's, it's real easy to, and it's a cop out to say, well, they shouldn't live at close to water. Shouldn't. A lot of these folks didn't live close to water. Nothing more than a little seasonal stream or creek that, that you know, ran out during the wet season and then and dried up for the rest of the summer. And, you know, here, if it floods here, it's biblical. Everybody's screwed up where I live up here on this hill. But, you know, my heart goes out to those folks. And, you know, like I said, rescue used to be my business. And, you know, being in the military as well, we got all state disasters and stuff like that. We always got activated for and we always went out and helped people. We cleaned up, we hauled water, we did everything that we could possibly do to help them folks. And, and that makes you feel good because you're doing good stuff for people who are in desperate need. But, you know, the <coughs> I have a friend of mine who's a nurse practitioner in that part of uh, South Carolina, right there on near the North Carolina border. And she said, it, it's, it's ridiculous. She said, Nothing is being done by the government agencies. It's all being done by local people. She said it, it's just horrible down there. And thankfully, she her place was spared and her family was spared. But she just, just right across the hill, buddy, it's all just complete devastation. And there's a video out there supposedly on the Internet. And I haven't seen it yet. But there's a bunch of people talking about it. Evidently, down there in western North Carolina, some FEMA official got kind of too big for his britches and was throwing his weight around and was preventing a lot of supply runs, preventing people to get up in to help other people. And evidently he got the hell beat out of him. You know, Appalachian Mountain folks were a different breed. We, we, we truly are. We, we are unique in our own culture and our own beliefs and our own practices. I mean, you can see down there, look at that. The first people in was not the federal government, was not the local government. The first people in were civilians, neighbors, community members, helping people out. And that's just how it is. That's just how it is. And you, you can't take away from that. You have to give the people props. But for, you know, government, well, FEMA's response to, to Hurricane Katrina will tell you enough. But the way that this is, is going down there, I mean, you're talking years before that place is, is fully recovered. And um, I think it was the last thing I seen was like 216 people had died from the flooding, 101 of them right there in western North Carolina, and there's still like 600 people unaccounted for. It's going to turn out to be bad, unfortunately. And they still haven't made it to all the other folks, um, you know, up in the hollows, way back up in the mountains and stuff like that, because the roads are gone, the bridges are gone. And uh, thankfully, got some good old boys down there helping their neighbors out. And that's what we like to see. There was even a guy brought mules in, did a mule team run back up in the mountains to, to get supplies to people. Man, that's how it should be. That's how every one of us should be at all times, but the world we live in. So my heart goes out to everybody affected by this hurricane. Uh, God bless you all. You know, we're, I, I, like I said, I can't load up my equipment and head down there. I wish I could, but we're going to do our part and, and take uh, supplies to a donation center here locally and, and do what we can to at least get some supplies down to you guys and help you out. And, you know, other than that, we're just going to keep you in our prayers and, I ask all of you to do the same thing. Keep those people in your prayers because most of them lost everything. They lost everything. But again, when it comes to emergency preparedness, if something like that happens, even if you weren't affected, you didn't lose your home or anything like that, it's been a week. They're, they're slowly restoring power, but to the higher population centers, like Asheville. And if people back up in the mountains, they have no power. They, if they had running water, unless they got a well that they can hand dip out of, or they got a generator for backup, which would be a plus, which I figure a good bit of them people down there do. I mean, they got no access to water, anything like that. Those poor folks running out of medicines, the older folks and everything. So, you know, there's a lot that still needs to be done. And, you know, the focus needs to be on getting access back in there and getting supplies to those folks. But, um, you know, I've said it before. Nobody's coming to rescue you, at least from the government side. So, you know, plan on self-rescuing 
have those prepared, have that preparedness in place, have plenty of water, have plenty of non-perishable foods, have alternate light sources, heat, everything, water filtration, sterilization, anything and everything like that. You've got to have, like I said, you know, FEMA says three days and these people are a week into it. That three day supply with a, even with a good bit of rationing is, is if it's not gone, there's, there's no more than a day left. So, like I said, that's up to everybody else, you know, what you decide to do. There ain't no grocery stores down there. there. ain't no groceries to be had. Everything's relying on donations and, and, and getting those supplies to people that they can't get access to. So, get yourself prepared. Guys, it, it's, it can happen at any time. So, I'll let you guys go at that. I'm going in the house to get some dinner. This camera makes it like look lighter out here, but the sun, it's setting. <laughs> So our work for today is done. As soon as that guy brings that gravel tomorrow, I'll be back at her. And uh, I'll do a final video and show you guys the end result of that. And then, of course, as we get in here to start tilling this up and everything like that. We finally did get some rain. Not a lot. We're, I think they said we were 10 inches um, below what, we're, what we should be. It would take at least 10 inches of rain to get us out of the drought level that we're in now. And we've maybe gotten two just enough to get the daggone grass growing again so now i got to put new blades on the mower because it doesn't more the ones out on it i got to put new blades on the mower and start mowing grass again i'm not looking forward to that anyways enough of me y'all take care get and stay prepared stay free god bless y'all